Hey FCF, we're back again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and um, I'm just going to read you verse 7. I kind of set it, set it up a little bit yesterday. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, it says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Now, if we were to read the verses to go before this, uh, verses 3, you know, all the way through um, 6, the Apostle Paul is talking to the Thessalonians about their, their sexual practices and morals. Um, he's trying to show them that Christian sexuality or the sexual practices of a follower of Christ need to be polar opposite of the culture. It's a fascinating thing. The culture of the biblical days, the Roman Empire days that Paul was writing in, uh, they're not that, that different than today. For example, it was, it was not an unusual thing for a, a male, a, a citizen of the Roman Empire in those days, to have a wife, to also have a mistress, and to also, uh, as a recreational outlet, go to prostitutes regularly. And that was never even looked upon as being sinful or immoral. And it was, it was just the culture. It was just something that, that people did. Uh, the females as well, they would have these these gatherings in these temples for the gods and goddesses and they would they would have lots and lots of food lots and lots of wine they would eat as much as they could drink as much as they could and then they would practice i'm not trying to be gross but they would practice what we call orgies today there would be multiple sex partners and sometimes bestiality and all kinds of things and once again they did not see that as being immoral they saw it as being part of believe it or not actual worship so when, when the Christian community came on the scene, their attitude towards sex was particularly jarring to the existent pagan community. And Paul is saying that needs to be, there needs to be this contrast. So let me read that verse 7 again. He says, God didn't call us to be impure. And if we were to read the verses before, he's talking about sexual impurity, but rather to, be, to live a holy life. Now, once again, what I said yesterday, there's, there's so much emphasis in Christian churches about just finding your way to get to heaven, and usually it revolves around you just got to believe the right things. I've even heard jokes, you know, like when you get to the gate of heaven, Peter will be there, and he'll ask you these questions, you know, why should I let you into the kingdom of heaven? And you have to have the right answer, and this is just nonsensical. Um, whereas human beings broke trust with God, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, and we became primarily those that trust in ourselves and we do things our way. When God revealed himself in Christ, the goal was that God would win back our trust because human beings were made by Christ for Christ. We can't be fully human and fully alive apart from him. We're image-bearing beings, and so we're, we're made to live in uni unity with God. So when that trust is restored, though, that trust is relational and it's dynamic, meaning this. Now, the infinite creator needs to guide me and guard me because I don't know the way he designed me. I don't know the way life was meant to be lived. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, and I, I often don't know what is the right thing. So, once we return to our infinite creator, we who are finite, it is only appropriate that we trust him, and then he helps us to learn, and in that learning, we put what he teaches us into practice, and in the doing, we develop. This is God's dynamic process of transformation. But I'm emphasizing transformation, and that's what the Apostle Paul was emphasizing to the Thessalonians, that they were actually called to be holy like God is holy. Now, God's holiness, you know, it's kind of hard to articulate it accurately, but essentially it's just this that God always does what is unselfishly, sacrificially good, regardless of what he, he himself is thinking, feeling. He, he's predictable. He's always good. He always uses his power, uh, power under the, the bridle, under the harness of his sacrificial love. So we're invited to be partakers of his holiness, that, that all the powers that we have as human beings, we're only going to use those the way that God has created them to be used. We're only going to use them to do good, to bless others. We're not going to use them to um, selfishly gratiate or satisfy our, our own desires that may be good sometimes and not good. So key point in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 is that we actually are invited 
by God to become holy. Now, I said something earlier. I'm going to repeat it and close with this. It is in the doing that we become. There was a time when you and I could not read, but someone started to croak us. You know, hey, learn these, these things called letters. And we learned A, and then we learned B, and then we learned C. Then we learned a little alphabet song. So we worked. We started working, doing something. Then we started learning little words like jump or, or light or uh, flip the dog in my day was, was in everything. So we kept at it, kept at it. It was in the doing, okay, the doing of work that we developed to one day become full-blown readers. And all the joys and all the opportunities that being able to read opens up to us. But, but I want you to see, this is God's developmental process. He's infinite. He knows what is right, knows what is best, knows the way he designed us. He shows us, he invites us to partake of it. And we are then, we have to be willing to start doing what he asks us to do before we can actually do it. I want to repeat that. We have to be willing to start attempting to do what he asks us to do before we can actually do it. Think about it. You, you had to attempt to start reading before you could ever do it. It was impossible for you to read, but you started fumbling around with letters, and then you learned the little um, you know, song, the little alphabet song, and so forth. God calls us to do things that initially are impossible, but as we attempt to do them, trusting in him, we get what we can do them a little bit, then we can do them a little bit better, and then a little bit better before you know it. We can do it on a very high level, and it almost becomes automatic, and, and we are changed beings. Um, you could apply this to almost any field. You could take a musical instrument. You can go from not being able to play an instrument to, if you stick with it long enough, to being a full-blown musician, a true transformation. So, you and I have been invited to be partakers of God's holiness one last thought. When we partake of his holiness and conduct, we also partake of his emotional quality of life. And these things like peace and joy and love start to, to grow within us and uh, all the blessedness that those inner conditions bring. All right, we'll stop for